Say hello to my not-so-little friend here. Yes, it's time, time for an SVS SB16 Ultra subwoofer dedicated review conversation video. I met the SVS folks at Audio Advice Live last fall, had a really excellent conversation there. It led to me actually getting two uh, of the SB16 Ultras basically for an extended demo review opportunity. And before the, the time period of that demo even expired, I liked them so much that I went ahead and bought them. Um, and since then, I went ahead and bought another pair. So let's get into some of the, the details, the nitty gritty, the, my likes, some of my uh, recommendations and areas for improvement and reflections on this now being the fourth subwoofer that I've had in the Techthusiasm home theater. So right off the bat, let's cover some minor specs. We're looking at essentially a cube here, 20 inches high, 19 and a half inches wide, and just short of 23 inches deep. That is including the metal grill on the front. It weighs in at a hefty 122 pounds, and we're looking at a single 16 inch front firing driver with an amp rated for 1500 watt continuous, 5000 watt peak power delivery. I don't want to make this just a laundry list of details and specifications, so of course if you want to get all of the information, take a look at the links down in the description, go to SVS's site, but I did want to make sure to at least kind of cover the highlights. Now I do have these all <laughs> set up where they're at, my room is calibrated and EQ'd, so I'm not pulling them out just for the sake of some pictures and B-roll, but I will put up an image of the back panel. So with regards to I.O., input output on the SB16, we're basically looking at a nice, a nice set of RCA and XLR inputs and outputs, which is awesome. We have a 12 volt trigger input. I do always like to see 12 volt trigger outputs, loop outputs, whenever you have an input. Unfortunately, they didn't do one there. So suggestion for improvement there on a future model. Uh, and that's really it. Uh, of course, there's not all of the types of crossover and base management controls on the back of the unit as there are on uh, a number of other subwoofers. That's because the SVS SB16 has a really, really great app. And so it's all DSP and controlled and configured and whatnot through the mobile app. I'm perfectly okay with that. The way that I set my stuff, I would never access the, the back controls on a subwoofer anyway. So to me, they're kind of just uh, dead knobs, dead dials, and whatever else may be back there. I much prefer being able to sit in my seat and access all of that command and control in an app anyway. There is some input on the front, of course. We have a seven segment display and some controls as well, giving you the ability to actually manipulate some of the options on the subwoofer from the front. I absolutely love this. You have the ability to dim it up and dim it down uh, to a lower extent. Of course, I do not leave it on during movie watching, during content. The thing that I like is the fact that you can have the display come on when the sub powers on and then set a timeout for it to go off shortly after that. Always gives you the assurance that, okay, I turned on my system, bass is pumping, audio is pumping, and everything powered on the way that it's supposed to. I don't have a, a random dead sub that I forgot to plug in or hook up from messing around the last time I was doing something in here. The display actually doesn't, I would say, doesn't have a lot of configuration options. You pretty much have it say like SVS or SB16 or whatever, or display the volume. I generally use it for the volume display. Fit and finish, I think, is just impeccable. So I did opt for the piano glass finish. There are two. There's an oak. I'm not a fan of stained oak as a wood. We have a lot of stained wood in our house, but we generally go towards hickory, maple, cherry, and other woods like that. I'm not a fan of oak. So piano black was an easy, easy choice for me. If you like the oak, hey, go for it. Of course, this is going to be a glossier finish and you can see we've got some downlight and stuff shining on it. However, for me, it's not a problem. I have these subwoofers very, very much to the far outside reaches of my screen. And so when I'm watching a movie, I can see the ever so slight little bit of, of glare of reflection kind of across the corner. But my screen is so big and my, my eyes, my focus is on the center of the screen for the video presentation that this doesn't bother me at all. Of course, your mileage may vary. If this subwoofer was sitting dead center in the middle of the room or the pair of them were, were closer in towards the center of the screen, then I may have a different opinion on that and might have opted or looked for something else uh, besides a reflective piano type finish. 
Build quality is amazing. They're hefty, they're strong, they're sturdy, they're stable. The grill is an interesting design. I think it gives it a little bit of like unique look and a little bit of unique character. In some respects, I might have just had a preference toward a more flatter grill with a magnetic uh, ceiling mechanism, but this is okay. The one thing about having a metal style grill that makes me a little bit nervous is, is that vibration and the noise that you get out of a, of a metallic type of vibration. But I can say after watching a number of movies in here with four of these in the room, there's no problem. The vibration, the metal it isn't a problem at all. And the only thing I recommend is if you're going to move these things around, try to get a friend. Um, it's a big hefty box picking it up by yourself, especially with the finish, which can be a little slippery in your hands. 122 pounds, depending on how much you hit the gym. Uh, could be tough. I actually did end up setting one of these down a little harder than I would have liked onto the floor, uh, onto the bottom corner, and just put the ever slightest set of cracks into the finish. I was really bummed out when I did that, but so ask some so ask for some help if you need it moving these moving these or other subwoofers around for sure. Packaging as well was also impeccable. It's a box within a box structure. You basically open up a bunch of flaps, slide the thing out. I have a video detailing the whole birthing sequence of getting the subwoofer out of the box um, here on the channel as well. One thing I do really appreciate in the packaging is that they actually had handles, uh, handles that you could grab in the side of the box rather than having to pick the box up from the bottom. Really, really intelligent thought there as well. Now about the app, I think they have an amazing, amazing app. I love when home theater devices come with smart, well-designed, well-functional and bug-free uh, control applications. I'll put up a little of this on the side panel here to take a look, but fundamentally everything that you would want to do to command and control the subwoofer is in the app. Of course, starting off with volume control, display control, and the like. All of your settings, your filters, phase polarity can all be adjusted inside of the app. The subwoofer does have, does have a three band uh, PEQ, and I appreciate smart app design. If you look at the PEQ sliders, what you'll find is that it's not just a slider that you have to kind of inaccurately grab with your finger and slide to a specific position such that when you want to get it like exactly at 30 hertz or something and you let it go and boom it jumps to 32. They actually have arrows on the far left and right side of the slider so you can tap the arrows and do very very fine-tuned adjustments. I'm all about smart and intelligent and good UI design here on the channel and their app definitely has it. You can load presets, you can do other configurations like rename the subwoofers, which I highly recommend, especially if you have a bunch of them. I tend to name mine by location, so there's front left, front right, and so on. Makes it very easy to pick the exact one that I'm trying to uh, address and configure within the app. And then last thing I'll say about the app as well, don't overlook the fact that there's a little up arrow at the very bottom of the app. I almost missed this, I didn't notice it right away. Um, in the first few times that I use the app. But amongst the things that you can do in the little pop-up menu at the bottom is they actually have help. The help is contextual, so if you pull it up for a given page of the app, it gives you information about what the controls are, what they do, how they work, and uh, some pages even have multiple pages of help giving you all the information that you would need or that you would want to be able to fully command and control the subwoofer. My hat is off to this. It's one of the best features, uh, element, logistical elements, I think, um, of the SB16. I will say too as a point of comparison to my time uh, of owning the Arundel subwoofers, I did find the Arundel app to be a little bit buggy, meaning that I would set things in it and they wouldn't actually take effect. It would like the setting would revert back. I've never had any problems, issues, uh, setting misconfigurations or anything like that in the SVS app. So way to go there. Let's talk about performance. Of course, performance has been <laughs> amazing impeccable, awesome, fantastic. I feel like the subwoofers in my room here deliver both a rich, full, enveloping level of bass, the gut punching level of bass that you would want, in addition to also carrying with them really great tactile feel. The tactile that I get from these subs is still awesome. It hits my chairs with a jolt, it hits my chairs with a shake. I get a lot of I get a lot of questions when I demo my room to people like, hey, do you have bass shakers? Do you have transducers? And it's no, I don't. We're just we're in a basement. We're on a concrete slab with a floating wood subfloor. There's enough bass power in here. And these these sub these subs deliver in that regard, giving both of those feelings of sensation in the low end. 
I did get the SVS sound path isolation feet. So all four subwoofers in the space right now are running with those feet installed. Gives them a slightly higher profile, which is okay. And I will say we've only done maybe three or four movies in the room since having the, the feet on the subwoofers. But I feel that it, it tightened things up in a way that my preference, I think, is to having the feet versus not having the feet. Even being in the basement and so on, maybe it's placebo, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's just one of those things in this hobby, but I feel the experience was improved having put them on versus having them off. And even the, the afternoon where my son and I, he helped me, we put the feet on all the subwoofers. Before we did it, we ran a bunch of demos sitting in here together. We put the feet on, we ran a bunch of demos after. He also commented that he felt that it was just like a little bit better of an experience, a little bit better of a bass response. It felt a little tighter, it felt a little richer, it felt a little fuller. You could feel just a little bit more kind of of an edge to it. And I think they charged like 50 bucks for those isolation feet anyway. It's pretty much like a no brainer. Get them, try it out. Maybe it makes a difference for you, maybe not. But amongst all the things that you could spend money on in the hobby, to me, it's kind of a no brainer. I will say too, for the price of the subwoofers, honestly, we're talking over $2,000 per subwoofer here, MSRP. On, on, the, on the premium models, at least the highest tier models in the lineup, they could probably just put the isolation feet in the box and call it a day. So as it is, my room is on the order of like 18, 19 feet long by about 17 or so feet wide, 11 feet tall at its highest point. Four of these just absolutely does the job in here. I have headroom for days. I have headroom that I will probably never even tap especially at the volume levels that I generally prefer to watch movies at, and particularly the volume levels that we're able to reach when I'm with the rest of the family, which is a lower threshold, uh, a good bit below my own. I can send this room into a complete tailspin with these subwoofers. If I really, really crank up the volume and I pull up something like that Edge of Tomorrow intro bass tone scene, everything's, go everything's going, everything's rattling, everything's shaking. Fully calibrated, normal calibration, even loud, but but comfortably loud listening levels. I don't have those problems. I can't hear those things in the room, but I like it because it tells me that there's far more power here. Again, there's far more headroom available to me if and when I ever want to tap it or if a scene in, in an instantaneous point ever demands it. These are going to be able to deliver plenty, plenty more um, than, than they would be putting out in just a normal in just a, a normal sequence of watching any old movie. I'm curious though to really kind of push them, crank them, push them, and go upstairs, go to some other rooms of the house and see like what, what kind of is the base propagation outside of the room as well as going outside of the house. We're on basically the north end of my home here. I live in like kind of a downtown towny area, so our houses are not too far apart. I'm sure I could be shaking my neighbor's house just to the north if I really wanted to. As it is though, my room is very tough on bass. I've talked about this in prior videos on the channel. The subwoofers at the front tend to experience a very, very heavy mid-bass 50-ish hertz region dip. Uh, and my subwoofers in the back kind of cover for that mid-bass performance, but they drop off much sharper in the lowest end, whereas the subs that are in the front can sustain the lower end. So if there was ever a, a poster boy for ha wanting to have four subwoofers, you know, or a good example of where sub four subwoofers really work together in concert with each other to deliver kind of a complete and a cohesive bass experience, my room is definitely that. So I'm grateful, I'm thankful, I'm very happy to be able to have four of these fully matching, same make, same model, same performance characteristic profile in each of the locations where I keep a subwoofer. Um, I am using one PEQ band on each sub. Before those mid-bass drop-offs, the subs all had these, these real, real pretty high peaks, actually. And so I figured that was probably the perfect place, perfect way uh, to use a, a single PEQ filter. Just bring down that peak in line with the general level of performance, the, the volume level of the subwoofers in some of the lower bass regions. And I, I had to apply it, I had to apply almost essentially the same point, the same cue and the same level of reduction, plus or minus a little bit, uh, to all four subwoofers. So I am grateful to have the PEQ feature in there. Um, I will show these measurements. This is, of course, using Anthem Arc Quick Measure on the AVM90 at the main listening position. These are my sweeps with the volume setting on the sub with the PEQ single point engaged. 
but without any arc correction being applied. And you can see basically how, again, the front subs really have those mid-base region dips. The subs in the back tend to fall off. And then I'll show as well a picture of, of all four subwoofer responses overlaid with each other. And again, you can see just how important it is for my space to have all of these work in concert with each other. Another thing to keep in mind with these measurements is I'm, I had to turn the volume down on these guys. Basically here, as you can see, if you can see right here, it's running minus 20. So that was about the lowest level of volume that I got to in terms of putting them where they needed to be ahead of running Anthem Arc Genesis calibration, knowing that I have four of these working together in concert with each other. They're not all at minus 20, if I recall correctly. Some might have been in the minus teens, but they all required a pretty significant reduction in volume. Again, giving me that assurance that headroom, headroom for days. <laughs> But I'm just absolutely loving it. I've got, I've got the room functioning at such a peak level of performance right now, such a peak level of integration between all of its componentry. And these are just absolutely a tremendous part of that whole picture, a tremendous piece of that whole puzzle. All right, so if we talk like specific comparisons, again, against some of these other subwoofers and brands that I've had in the room, several years ago when I put this home theater together for the first time, I did have a pair of RHEL S5 SHO subwoofers. That was my first real subwoofer, uh, home theater subwoofer experience in here. I had a pair of them. I kept them both at the front of the room, but I will say it's been some years since I sold those and my just relying kind of on audio memory I never experienced anything close to the level of performance. Again, volume, headroom, presence, pressurization, and all that sort of thing uh, with the RELs. The RHEL, in many ways, I just think, technically speaking, it can't compete. It's a smaller driver. It has an amplifier that's like a third uh, of the power of these in a much smaller box. So I think those RELs would have been great at like in a living room, perhaps even more in a music-based system, whatnot. Um, I think they can, the brand can still do some work in home theater, but it, it's not even necessarily, I think, a fully fair comparison given size, power, scope, and stuff like that. The Har bottle, I had that Har bottle in here. The, the, the review video and, and some coverage is available from the channel further back. Um, that thing was just an absolute beast. It was a monster. It was big. It was tall. 18-inch driver. More powerful all around, but it's also a significantly more expensive subwoofer. So if you're shopping, I think to the order of at least like 2x the price, perhaps, if not more, depending on which specific tuning and the specific configuration of the hard bottle. So again, in some ways, as much as it's a little bit unfair to compare these to the REL S5s, I don't think you can necessarily compare the hard bottle to these either. If you're looking to spend several thousand dollars on a subwoofer, it opens up a whole gamut of new options at a new level of like uh, price performance um, and a, a differing level of value as well for what you're getting for what you're spending. So if if you're if you're in that that price point um, and you're looking at bigger bigger monsters like that, it's just a different kind of unit and, and it's awesome. With these, I can definitely already overpower the room. If I had like four hard bottles in here, I could be like cracking the foundation uh, in my basement walls here behind me. The big comparison I think people have always been asking about is the comparison against the Arundel. That's a fair one, very similar price points. Again, I did have the 1723 2S subwoofers, similar price, similar sizing, all of that sort of stuff. And my main takeaway is that I feel like the Arundel was like laser tight. Like it just, it felt like it cut like a, like a ninja blade when that bass kind of the, the hit and it rolled through and it shocked in a certain way, I feel that the SB16 is more of a rounded bass experience, meaning that the Arundel was tight in the tactile, but it felt thinner to me in the, the overall like body uh, feeling, hearing and feeling at the same time versus just kind of getting that jolt. When I say that, one thing to keep in mind is that for the longest time, the majority of the time really that I had the Arundels, I was running both of them in the front of my room, which is, as admitted, the worst places in this space for that mid-bass gut punching type of, ba of, of feeling. Now, I did end up leaving one Arundel up front for a good while, and I moved one to the back so that they could work in concert with each other. 
but I never actually did, I would say, a full apples to apples comparison of one and one Arundel uh, front left, back right to one and one SVS in the same positions. It, just, it would have been a, a massive undertaking to move stuff in, move stuff out, and try try to just spend the time doing all of that. I did for a period of time run two of the SB16s with both of the Arundels. In that case, I had the SB16s up front and I had the Arundels in the back. At the end of the day, you can kind of surmise ultimately, of course, where I ended up and where I spent my money was with these over versus sticking with the Arundels and even buying more of them because getting to four Sobofers was the kind of goal I set for the room in 2023. I think there's a lot of things to like about both subwoofers. Um, in fact, if I could get the finish of the Arundels on these, I would prefer it. I had like the matte black painted finish and I really, really, really liked that finish. I think way better than the, the oaky stained uh, look of some of these subwoofers. It doesn't have the truck bed liner, like cheap, cheaper feel. I think that so other, some other subwoofers use, but it didn't have the gloss and fingerprint magnet, dust magnet that the piano black kind of finishes have. I think the matte in the Arundel is basically like the perfect finish for subwoofer. It looks classy, it looks premium, it doesn't reflect as much and has a lot of virtues to it. As I mentioned earlier, I did find that the Arundel app wasn't the most bug-free experience. In fact, there were a number of things over time that I wanted to set on the Arundel that I was never really able to configure because the, the settings just wouldn't commit um, in the app itself, I do feel the SVS app is a superior experience. And again, I do appreciate having the displays on these, whereas the Arundel didn't have any visual indication that it was powering on and working. You just had to listen for them. One other element that I'm, that I'm thankful for and that I think I do prefer is for me having one uh, single driver in the subwoofer that I know is firing out into the room. In my setups, I was going with corners for all of my subwoofer positionings. I've got a wall right here. And when we had the side firing drivers then, half of the subwoofer, one of those is basically pumping right into that wall because of the way I've got them positioned. The other side firing drivers are basically sending their base signals right into each other. Now, base is omnidirectional and all of that. So I might be making a little bit more out of that than it actually has any real acoustical merit or value to. However, I like the peace of mind of it, just knowing that I don't have to doubt my positioning, my integration, or anything like that. The bass is just firing out into the room. It's coming from a single point source, and, and so I have that preference for these as well. So final thoughts in the end here. I think I'm set for a long time. These subs have great aesthetics. I love the consistency. Again, having four units of the same exact make and model. Performance is top-notch. Features are top-notch. The only place that I could go from here would be to spend considerably more money to basically get to another tier. We would be talking about per listen subwoofers. We'd be talking about like JTR RS1s, maybe back to the Har bottles, whatever it may be. Probably something with 18 inch drivers instead of 16s. And as I've said, four 16s can do more work in here than I probably have any realistic need for. Why would I do 18s just for the sheer fun of it so that I can say that I had four 18s, but my room in its current incarnation, I don't think really even needs that headroom. It would be something that I could do just to do it rather than any like uh, driving need or trying to overcome some element like lacking in the base response of my system. And any of those options would just come with such more considerable amount of, of spending out of pocket. I've got a laundry list of other things that I could probably do with that money, both in my system and outside of home theater first. But who knows, of course, never say never. Stay tuned to the channel. We'll see where we go in the years ahead. These are highly, highly recommended. Um, I think the brand is great. I think they've been exceptional to work with and engage with. Just a great offering. Absolutely tech enthusiasm recommended. If you are looking to pick up these or any other SVS equipment for that matter, please do recognize now I am set up as an SVS affiliate, of course. So if you go through my links to buy SVS gear direct, there will be a revenue share uh, available to me. You can help support the channel, very easy way to do it. Or of course, purchase through one of my other preferred affiliates, which is Audio Advice, who sells the whole lineup of SVS equipment as well. 
Thanks so much for watching. Leave, uh, leave your thoughts. Do you have SPS subwoofers? Have you been considering them? What do you like about them? If you didn't buy them, you opted for something else. Why was that? Share your stories in the comments because I'm sure other folks can benefit. Other folks that are shopping and debating their base decisions could benefit from reading your takes as well. Otherwise, please do all that regular YouTube stuff. Of course, like, subscribe, hit the bell, share the video. If you'd like to support the channel, again, use those affiliates. It's really such the best way to do so. Otherwise, uh, become a channel member. Would love you to do that. Come join uh, with the other folks that have done so. Leave a super thanks, leave a PayPal or a Venmo tip. There's a bunch of information down below in the description. Thanks so much for watching. Come on back for more home theater discussion and fun.